Ime, Katie, Manfredi, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Okay. I'm going to get started in a second, but I just want to tell everyone in the audience that we do want to make this session interactive. So do send in your questions, and very shortly we're going to be polling you, so do be ready with your phones. You'll see a QR code, you can scan it, and get ready to answer our poll question. Now, we are living in challenging times. We spent the morning talking about the geopolitical tensions we're seeing in the world right now. We have a difficult economy, and we have new problems thrown at us uh, by AI every other day. But I'm an optimist, and I believe we still have an opportunity to accumulate wealth, and uh, we are hoping that over the next half hour or so, you might tell us where those opportunities lie. So, Ime, I want to begin with you. Given that we do have a difficult market environment, we've seen the launch of new funds slow down. So, tell me, China AMC's strategy, what is your strategy to deal with such a difficult market? Well, thank you very much, and it's such a great honor to be here today. Um, well, it just has been the hardest three years, actually, in China's mutual fund industry with such a bearish market environment. But for us, because China AMC, our goal is to actually, well, to, to like Legos, we, we lay out the cubes that will best position ourselves and our strategies in any kind of environment. So in this kind of scenario, we really try our best to actually use our own money as seed money. So our IPOs didn't really slow down. In the past several years, we actually, in the three, past three years, we launched more than 150 new funds, new strategies in different areas that we think will best serve the interest and coming trends in the future. Manfredi, you have said before that you describe yourself as a contrarian investor and somebody who likes to look at neglected areas. So as of May 2024, what area looks rather neglected to you? There are so many. I mean, every area which is not sexy is neglected, no? So what's not sexy at the moment? <laughs> uh, today, for example, in the, the spirits, we were saying, yeah. it's that uh, consumers, I don't know why, it's one of the first times that with a crisis, consuming uh, consumption of spirits is not growing. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it's a great moment to buy businesses and then improve them and grow them. So that's one of the areas. Uh, service companies in certain areas which are, for example, related to shipping. Shipping is a business which is booming, but there are services to shipping which are not in the radar screen of anybody. So mm. if I have to look, I try to look, I wouldn't tell you what I'm looking at, <laughs> but I mean, there are things which are in areas which uh, are ports and things like this which are uh, neglected. But they have a steady uh, flows of business, good, very good perspectives. Besides being contrary, I'm, I'm opportunistic. Mm -hmm. And then I try to go where I can bring value added because of my relationships and my knowledge. And I can, have, I can bring good management with me. Because without good people, whenever I did without knowing I had good people, it didn't go well. Mm -hmm. Katie, I want to talk to you about the, the economic picture. Let's talk about the US Federal Reserve and interest rates. There is a feeling we might see some rate cutting by the end of this year. What does that mean? What would that mean for portfolios and for asset allocation? Sure. Um, I'm happy to speak to the macro. I, I am gonna, I'm going to ask Manafredi one, one follow-up question to help frame what I was going to say, if I could. Yes, you. yes. So you, you've invested in many travel companies. We were talking yeah. about it, but can you give us a sense of what you're seeing in the consumer? You said spirits is weaker, which would be across the con high to low end. And what do you see through travel? Well, I, I see the high end. Just as yeah. I, I focus there because that's what I understand. That is where I have the relationships with the trade and I have the management. It's extremely strong. I mean, you know, it's an increase of uh, consumers who can trade up. Yeah. Uh, prices are very good. Margins are improving uh, on the, what you, you deliver. So it's very, very good. You do have areas of competition, which is, uh, for example, if you want to order a, a cruise ship now, it's very mm -hmm. competitive because cruises are so expensive, so successful yeah. that ordering ships is becoming very expensive. And because it takes now four years to build a cruise ship, that would take three years. Mm -hmm. So the capacity of production is always the same. 
but uh, that number, so it's going to cost more because the costs are related, not the same. So, but, uh, you know, the, the inflation in general, except for labor, has been massive. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. And I'm going to come, I wanted to get your thoughts on the consumer because I'll make a quick comment on that in the macro. But um, big picture, when we yeah. look at the rest of the year, um, I, I don't have the proverbial crystal ball, so I can't tell you when and if exactly rates are going to be cut. But I want to give people a broader perspective of how we see the world. Um, there's two ways this is going to work out from here. Uh, the first is that we get a soft landing, which is yeah. what the market's obviously pricing in at the moment. Um, and that happens rarely, but could happen, and that would be amazing. Um, and if we have that soft landing, it's our view that rates would still stay elevated. Steady. Okay. Um, and then on the other hand, and I'll come back to the implications of this, we get a recession, um, and the world does move in cycles, so eventually we'll have a recession. It's hard to tell exactly when that would happen. But we are seeing some signs of weakening in the labor market. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to get an outright recession, I'm talking about the U.S. right now, to state the obvious, um, we need a weaker consumer. That's why I was asking about the consumer, which makes up 70% of GDP. Um, make a quick comment on that and then come back to the implications. What we know in the U.S., which I'm, I'm going to focus on the U.S. because it's the world's largest economy and the consumer is the largest consumer yeah. in the world, so very Im important for global growth trajectory. We know that the low end of the consumer is under a lot of pressure, and that's come through clearly the last couple of quarters. There's a cost of living crisis. Any consumer company that caters to low end consumer um, has reported on that. What we've seen more recently um, is the middle class consumer starting to come under some pressure. So if you look at, for example, Starbucks is a yes. great bellwether for the middle class consumer. They've seen uh, traffic slow down pretty materially. Mm -hmm. There's just one anecdote, but it's a good way to think about it. Their core customer, their hardcore customer that goes every day, like me, um, <laughs> has hung in there that needs their caffeine and is willing to pay for it. Yep. But then the, the one that goes in there as a treat, which is still the middle class consumer, has fallen off pretty dramatically. Yeah. So I would say we're in the early stages of seeing some downward pressure on the consumer. And then, of course, we would need job destruction. And I don't say that lightly. There's human misery that comes with that, but yeah. that's what you need for a recession. And we haven't seen that yet. But pulling that together in either of these scenarios, what we would say is that um, there is the potential of a credit event. Because even in the soft landing scenario, if rates stay elevated, we still have a math problem for a lot of companies who had capital structures put in place the last couple of years that were highly levered, um, and they were put in place with the expectation that rates would stay zero. They haven't, they won't, and those are going to start to come under pressure. We've actually seen the largest number of corporate defaults year to date, not in private credit, which I can come back to, but just broadly corporate defaults that we've seen since the GFC. So there is some pressure there. And then if you get a recession scenario, that's pretty obvious how it yeah. creates a credit event. And I'll just end by saying, Against that macro backdrop, w what does that leave us to be doing? Um, by background, TCW manages private credit, public credit, and public equities. In credit markets and public markets, we're overweight securitized assets, agency MBS, which is carrying over the index. And we're waiting for something to break, which we think, regardless of the economic scenario, as I just articulated, there's going to be some likely credit events down the road, and we want to be a liquidity provider uh -huh. when, when that happens. And I will say that the complacency of the market, to me, is, is incredible in two ways. First, we've had record IG issuance this year. Uh -huh. So there's clearly appetite from if I were an issuer, I would also issue at record credit tights. Um, but there's been appetite to pick that, not from us, but from others to pick that up. Um, and I'm just going to end by saying on the complacency point, you know, there are some difficulties ahead. You, out, you, you alluded to them in your opening comments, and yet we are at equity valuations that are top decile, and we're at credit spreads that haven't been this tight in 20 years. So to us, the credit spreads and the level that they're at now are inconsistent mm -hmm. with, the like, with the macro backdrop, whether we get a recession or not. Well, I want to see what the audience is thinking. So we have a poll, and I want you all to weigh in on the poll as well. So let's see if we can get the poll question up. Let's see. But I'm going to ask you anyways, and uh, there we go. So which asset class do you believe provides the most compelling opportunities in the next 12 months? So if you have your phones out, please do uh, send in your response. And while we're waiting for the audience to weigh in, let me ask you, which one would you pick if you can just 
tell me one, two, three, four, or five, which one? Email, start with you. Um, well, I think definitely both four and five seems very interesting right now. Commodities and crypto Mod for you. Commodity and the cryptos, so especially cryptos. Okay, yeah. Aman Freddy. Uh, equities, I've always invested in equities. Well, equities? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're gonna stick with equities, okay. I'm a simple guy. Equities, yep. equities. Okay, Katie. I think from here, my idea would be in the second category, but more specifically, again, regardless of the macro environment, we see tremendous opportunities for rescue finance. Okay. That these higher rates are going to work their way through the system and create one of the first distress cycles in private credit and great opportunities for rescue finance. Okay, so it looks like most people are with equities. Wow, that surprises yeah, me. That's interesting, isn't it? So since the room is voting in favor of equities, Aman Freddy, you talked about, you pick <laughs> equities, you win. <laughs> What's yes. surprise? <laughs> What's surprise? <laughs> you know, in the long run, it's no comparison what you get. If, you're, if you have a staying power, you can finance any that. kind of uh, revenue drop on, uh, on companies. If the product is good, it's, there's no comparison to the return. But you have a very interesting way of picking equities. You do it directly, don't you? Yes. I, I only, on the stock exchange, one stock, which, which one? I know very well, Royal Caribbean. Yes, Royal Caribbean. <laughs> yes of I, course. I'm very confident. I know that <laughs> yes. it's an incredible, very well-managed company, fantastic sector. So uh, how do you pick the equities that you're going to put your money in? It's very opportunistic. Okay. It's very opportunistic. Then I try to give myself rules. So when I, I, when I did, I, I divested my silver sea company, I tried to give myself a rule. I said, okay, I immediately bought a company, Abercrombie and Canton. Yeah. And I, yeah. Then I said, okay, I'll keep, that's gonna be one third. Then I'll keep about 40% cash. Mm -hmm. They said shares, I don't wanna have problems in my life. Uh, <laughs> then I'll invest some of it. The problem is I invested too well my money when I bought my business. Mm -hmm. yeah. So now it's overwhelming the part which is the business Abercrombie and Kent and Crystal. So I have to find a way to fix it, mm. and to rebalance uh, uh, in other ways. So that's, then we get a lot of opportunities. So uh, Ukraine war starts, a friend of mine had 50% of a company with a partner, the partner had to sell because he was uh, submerged by debt. Mm -hmm. I was the only buyer. Only so buyer, I gave him a yeah. price out of mercy. And it, it was a great company and it's growing and it's of course it was in the spirits. It's a great opportunity. And they brought us another business where you talk about 100,000, these kind of things. So they brought me a startup, which is not really a startup, already developed ice cream mm. production. A very good Italian ice cream. Italian ice creams are the best, we all know. Yeah. <laughs> and so, this, so and I, I, I committed some of the money. Then I, it's small money, so I don't want to to lose too much time on small things. Then I went to the people working with me and I said, I syndicated, I gave them 100,000 tickets to these people, they're gonna make five times their money. Mm -hmm. They could not do it by themselves, but following me, they could do it. Mm. But Katie, this is an interesting time for someone who wants to put their money in equities, right? Because the number of IPOs we are seeing, it's, it's going down. I mean, last year was low, it was uh, the year before that, the number of, deal was even lower. So talk to me about what a challenge this, face, this is for people wanting to put their money in equities. Yeah, I, there's two separate issues. So at the meta level, the public markets are shrinking pretty dramatically. Right. And that is shrinking the opportunity set. I mean, you've only found one, right, that you like, <laughs> Royal Caribbean. Um, but it is... Well, I, I know it very well. I mean, you know, it's... Uh... And which is a good... Like, you should invest in what you know, so I, I respect yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but it has shrunk from 7,000 companies 20 years ago to half that. And um, that's happened for a variety of reasons. Yeah. The perpetual availability of private capital through private equity. It's less fun to be a public yes. equity CEO now. Um, and that's a real trend that we should be aware of, I'll come back to. Last year, again, there was, there was less IPOs than people thought. Part of it's that secular trend. Part of it was just that there wasn't visibility on rates, and so the IPO market closed. Right. We've seen some recovery this year. But I think the point you're making is a good one. 
Um, we are in an environment where the public markets have shrank and just, again, 50% less companies than there were 20 years ago. There should be multiples more yeah. than there were. And so investors have to be really selective when they think about what parts of the public markets they want to invest in. And obviously, ideally, they should be capturing part of that opportunity set through, through private markets as well, both mm -hmm. equity and debt. One, one last comment. I, I think when you look at credit markets, what we're seeing, and the pr private credits become obviously very topical, yeah. it's very mirrored to what happened in my experience running equity markets for the last 20 years. We're just in the early stages of the credit markets being disrupted and more public capacity going private. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, obviously, what we're all trying to do is build portfolios for investors that cover both. And I'll just end by saying in equity markets, what we do at TCW is that we acknowledge that the, the developed markets, and in particular the S&P 500, is available highly efficiently with liquidity and tax efficiency and transparency for almost zero basis points. Mm. So we don't compete in that part of the market. What we do is we offer very differentiated equity strategies that are either highly concentrated in developed markets or we're focused on three themes of disruption that we build portfolios in that we think are positioned to win uh, over the long term. And they're focused on AI, climate transition, and supply chain disruption are the main areas we're focused on thematically. And I believe yeah. that you can still find clients to partner with you if you do things that are active and differentiated and oriented for the long term. There's a lot of inefficiency out longer term. And people are underweight those themes in a yeah. market cap weighted portfolio. So they're good ones for clients to lean into. I want to come back to AI, but before we do that, Ime, you had picked in the poll commodities and crypto. <laughs> now, uh, China Asset Management, your company launched a crypto ETF in Hong Kong just a few weeks ago. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. So what's the response been? And are you finding that people really are looking for more diversified portfolios? Yeah, that was uh, really a great experience because it was uh, two, uh, two weeks ago, actually, exact two weeks ago. Um, so I guess that was the define, one of the defining moments in Hong Kong's capital market because we, it's the first time actually we can have a spot ETF and we can do in-kind creation for cryptocurrencies. And this is very surreal in the sense that finally there's a connection between the crypto world and then the traditional you know, financial markets. So from our point of view, and this is the first time actually people, especially for real um, you know, retail investors, so in the past, the, the traditional retail investors, if they want to invest in cryptocurrency, there's huge barriers and they have no idea how to do it. And yeah. now we can see that so many distribution channels in the past they don't really want to talk to us. And now they are just, you know, start to actively engaging us how to offer this kind of products to their end investors, which is amazing how much I think the demand and interest are right now in Hong Kong. And also we've seen so many institutional investors, even though this is very early stage, they are trying to test the waters. They are yeah. trying to, you know, just buy some and invest a little bit to see how that will affect the volatility and the asset allocation of their portfolio. So this is amazing. And we see great trend and opportunities in this area. I, I think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Manavir. No, ladies first. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say I, I, the congratulations on the launch of that. Obviously, in the U.S., we had some big ETF launches in crypto uh, for people who who, who are believers in that asset yeah. class. And, and I would say that those ETF launches are kind of like the IPO phase of the asset class. You said institutions are slowly looking at it. If you are a believer in crypto, this would cement the very early innings of how Katie, that asset class are you class a believer? I, I think that there's a place for it in people's yeah. portfolios. I guess it's not just real believers, but still I think people are looking at so many ways to diversify Diversi the yeah. portfolio. Yes. And also there was just this joke because on the first day, one of the Bloomberg anchor actually tweet that if this could reach 1 billion of USD in three months, he will come to Hong Kong and buy everyone's sushi. So we will see if that sushi <laughs> really? is going to come or not. Um, yeah. Manfredi, one thing I want to ask you is that 
you know, over the last couple of years, and it happens when we have political uncertainty in the world that people shift their assets, right? Uh, there's a lot of cross-border movement with money. We saw, for example, a lot of money from Russia move towards the Middle East. Do you think the Middle East can become a global wealth hub the way Switzerland has? It is already. It is already? Yeah. I have so many friends who have moved here or are moving here, either their funds or their family assets, and uh, even to live here. And the movement which is going to be out of England, you know, 66,000 non-doms. The non-doms, yes. Seeking for a new home for yes. their money and for themselves. Uh, you know, and with the trend of uh, taxation in Europe and in the States, a lot of people are going to start moving. So it is. I mean, you know, what you need is certainty of legal and fiscal environment. And political and we stability. Have this year. Mm. Okay. Besides, to be competitive, you need to have less burden on your capital. Because otherwise, you produce capital and you pay taxes and your competitor in Dubai doesn't. So you need to have reduced taxation. Otherwise, you have a limitation of accumulation of capital or profitability of the companies. So there's the asset here of stability and the certainty of the rule of law and uh, for corporations and for tax is massive, I think. Uh, so I think that it is. And so many more, more and more people are moving uh, here. I have chosen my life to be in Monaco. It's okay. a small uh, emirates. We have a ruler who is the prince. There's very big stability. We've always had the same tax rules. They don't change. The governments have very limited uh, authority. Mm -hmm. The government is the government of the prince. He decides his government and he rules the country. And it's very stable. So you know what is going on. It's, uh, it's an incredible uh, privilege uh, that way. So I think that is, uh, I wanted to add something. Yeah. You know, these two ladies, they manage massive capital. Yes. Managing massive capital, they have access to very high talent. So I'm, in, I'm competing with them to allocate my money. So mm -hmm. I do not have access to the same things they have. So I have always to make myself smart. Where can I beat them? There are a few things where I can beat them. I can beat them through my connectivity, my relationships, because I can go directly. And then my relationship employs immediately my money, which is limited, so I can find. And in the very fast decision-making process. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have to be very opportunistic, very contrarian, very uh, going in areas which I know well. Because otherwise, if I go and I have to compete with them, I'm going to be a loser. <laughs> But I don't, I don't want to compete. I want to be friends so I can get a good deal. I have your business card <laughs> here travel. on the Abercrombie and Kent, my next Abercrombie and Kent tour. So yes, we'll be that's, friends. I'm always glad. Okay. I can't they they never want me to bring, because whenever I bring somebody to the company, I, I advocate for my friends. Yeah. Oh, don't charge them money. <laughs> I'm not a very good salesman, but there it is. I can't believe we're almost out of time, yeah. but I want to do something a little bit different and fun. We're going to have a rapid fire round. So I'm going to ask you to respond in literally like three or four words. Okay. No more, okay? Biggest challenge to wealth creation, Katie? Uh, current account deficit in the U.S. driving inflation. Okay, current account deficit. Manfredi, biggest challenge to wealth creation? Stupid government legislation. Okay, <laughs> accepted. <laughs> Which is dominant. Ime? Uh, adaption to new technology. Oh, I wish we had more time to talk about AI, and yeah. but we'll, we'll, we might have to do that backstage. If you had 100,000 US dollars to invest right now, where would you put your money? I already, I would do capital solutions, rescue finance for companies struggling with the interest rate. Ready. For interest Small rate. ice cream company, Small. which is going five times the money over money in five years. Okay, that sounds good <laughs> to me. And delicious. Yeah. Already did it. <laughs> and half in crypto and half in AI equity. All right. Okay, yeah. there you go. This is the biggest election year in the history of the world. Uh, we have multiple elections going on, U.S. elections coming up in a few months. Geopolitics, as we know, does affect wealth creation. The next president of the U.S. will be? No idea. Oh, okay, I'll <laughs> give you a pass on that. Me? Yes. What my wallet hopes. What that's your the wallet hopes. Thing. Yes. Who's going to be he better hopes for hopes Trump, the wallet. The wallet hopes uh, Trump? The heart will not say I'm not American, so it's nothing of my concern. 
for okay. my money, I think uh, Trump. But I don't think he's going to win. Okay. Because the deep state is, uh, I mean, look at him. Everybody's campaigning, he has to be in a courtroom. Ime? Uh, well, I wish it's either Michael Bloomberg or Michelle <laughs> Obama. <laughs> We, we can send that message back. <laughs> and my last question is, wealth to me, what does wealth mean to you? Wealth to me is? Uh, time with my family. And Freddy? Freedom of choice. I love that. Well, the ability to change a better world. Oh, what a good note to end on. Thank you so much, Ime Manfredi, Katie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. Thank you.